This new economy, I think of it like an emerging economy, crypto land. So how do economies work? Economies work, GDP growth is driven by population growth, productivity growth, and debt growth. Those are the three components that make GDP grow. So when you go to the fiat world, we've got aging populations and in many countries shrinking. We've got low productivity that may get changed by AI and other stuff, but it's still yet to be proven. But the old population is less productive. And debt growth stopped essentially in 2008. And all new debt growth uh, is really just servicing of old debts. When we go to this new emerging economy, we have population growing at 100% a year, which is the number of active wallets. If you think of it, it had a massive recession in crypto land in 2022, and the population grew 42%. So it's like, okay, this is an amazing thing. So obviously GDP growth is faster. Productivity growth keeps increasing. Things like smart contract was a new increase in productivity for crypto land. Let's say compressed NFTs, maybe what Solana's doing with Firedancer, maybe ZK Proofs, all these things are productivity increases. And then debt growth, well, we've just wiped out the debt from the last cycle, so we're going to rebuild debt again this cycle, because that's what humans do. They love a bit of debt. So free trade agreements really are all about, where do I get my highest return on capital? So people want to do free trade agreements with India because it's a growing population, large economy. It's the same thing. Fiat world will be saying, well, am I going to get a higher rate of return over in crypto land? In which case, I'll put some of my money at work there. That's why this is important. It's not about a single event of, you know, we're just going to bring RAAs in. It's, it's something much bigger. It's bridging these worlds. And then as it, the money comes into crypto land, it then finds its way into the other states within crypto land, whether it's Bitcoin land or whether it's ETH land or Solana land or whatever it may be. And it gets reallocated on the risk curve. Some of those are smaller emerging states and some of them are more established. So when people think of it like that, it's just an emerging market that's opening up for people to be able to invest. In. My mental model for this particular cycle is the everything, everywhere, all the one cycle. Because if we think about it, $67 billion went into VC, into the space in uh, 2020 and 2021. That money has been given out to founders who are building all sorts of applications and projects and everything else. Some of them will be infrastructure layer, some will be applications layer and everything in between. And if you see the focus of where most of these teams are working on, it's kind of everywhere. So we're seeing the, the asset management that the fiat world companies are building on rails from crypto land. So, you know, this is Franklin Templeton. This is all of these people looking at tokenizing real world assets. I think that starts, the first wave of that starts. Then we're seeing at the other far end of the spectrum is everybody's focused on gaming because there's a huge audience there. So somebody's going to crack gaming in some respects and pretty much every protocol is, is is has got teams working on that we've got in the middle okay things like compressed nfts and solana i think are a much bigger deal than people understand because i think it allows for ticketing and ticketing is at scale consumer application of blockchain of which you don't need to know it's blockchain which is what the space has been waiting for so i think it's more the applications of technologies than technologies i think we've also got the identity idea that's, you know, there's WorldCoin, there's a few people who've started in that space, you know, and then using zero knowledge proofs, which came around in the last cycle, the applications layer from that. So I'm just thinking it's actually going to be broader than people imagine. And it's going to be more inclusive because we've now got this trade deal that the, the ETFs, because I think, you know, we've got the Bitcoin one certainly coming and it's a pretty high chance we'll get the ETH one as well. We're seeing a much earlier ramp in the cycle than we've seen in the past, which is very interesting. You know, it's very rare to be this strong this early in the cycle. Now, we are front-running some of the capital flows, and so there's probably some correction that happens by the rumor sell the fact. But I think if the space continues like this and we start getting monetary easing and the other conditions that tend to jumpstart the business cycle again, um, then we should see a very strong 2024 and most likely a strong 2025. The business cycles have been almost like clockwork two year up cycles, one year peaking, one year down. And that corresponds. What's amazing is the Bitcoin halving cycle is the same as the debt refi cycle, which is I think what drives everything. It's the same as the election cycle. They're all the same thing. So, you know, if that continues to repeat, then it should go until 2026 when that should be a bear market year. But, you know, 
let's see. So I am obviously very bullish. The institutions, it depends whether they give the yields of ETH in the ETF or not. If not, a lot of the institutions prefer would prefer to own ETH itself because then they can they can stake it and get yield. Huh. Because if you don't give them yield, some asset manager who launches the ETF is going to get rich. BlackRock, they'll make all the money because they'll get the ETH staking yield and they don't give it to the to the ETF holder. And we've seen that very commonly in, in, in ETFs in the past. So I think that's the thing because when I speak to institutions, they get ETH. So Ethereum is broad, deep, and has no career risk in building on it. So it's, you know, it's, it's the established, it's the establishment. It's like, if you want to build in this space, that's the easiest place to go. The, the, the density of talent, the, uh, the density of applications, the density of knowledge is immense. So how can you not be bullish on that, right? That's always going to attract people. It's always going to create a rich and vibrant ecosystem. Solana is kind of the new kid on the blog, but you know, there you've, managed to solve one of the problems that ETH was struggling with, which was speed and cost. So two of those, um, they've managed to solve without compromising security. So, okay, that's interesting. So that's why we've seen a lot of people start building on Solana. And we've seen a very, very vibrant ecosystem being built. And so ETH had to solve that with layer twos, essentially. Well, it doesn't have to happen in Solana. Crypto markets are forward looking. So most people are saying, well, we're probably around a recession. We're seeing unemployment go up. Crypto knew about this last year because it's forward looking. It actually trades on liquidity conditions. And I do a lot of macroeconomic research at my research company, Global Macro Investor. And for us, the liquidity cycle just keeps going for the next two years. So we will see a bottoming of the economy. Uh, maybe Q1, Q2 of next year, the people will visibly start to see things improving, but the markets are already trading it. The equity market's already almost back at the all-time highs, crypto markets ripping because they're discounting this. If we live that six months in the future, are the Fed likely to be raising rates or cutting rates? Cutting rates. At worst, they don't do anything. But that's so the probability is for easing of liquidity conditions. You know, is there a chance because we're going to an election year that they stimulate with fiscal stimulus, pretty much 100% chance they'd like to buy votes. So 2024 is all about stimulus um, and economic recovery. That's a very, very, very good backdrop. And that's the transition from crypto and macro spring into crypto macro summer. 